Hi, this is Greg with the Dapper Man. I'm here with Kenny Winston from uh, Rem Smoke Shop, and today we're going to be smoking the Hoya Cinco Tequeras, so stay tuned. Welcome back. Before we actually get to the uh, cigar here, I want to actually welcome some new subscribers. We actually have several uh, to talk about today. We have the Spoken Chimney, we have Jordan G, we have Smoking Ronnie, Chad C, and James H. Everybody, thank you for joining the channel. Uh, welcome to the Dapper Man family. We are glad you like our videos. If you haven't subscribed yet, uh, go ahead and hit the, uh, somewhere around here, there's a little uh, bell notification. Uh, go ahead and hit that and hit the subscribe and you'll be notified once I post a new video. We do have one comment to talk about. This was from our Raw from Rems Volume 2, and it was Make My Day 44 Mag. Uh, said he's actually, uh, he likes the selection here at Rems. He's actually been to the store, and it's a fantastic location, a fantastic place to smoke a cigar. So uh, thank you for the comment. If you have any comments or questions on our videos, please, uh, you can put them in, in the comments on YouTube, or you can find us on social media at um, like Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, all at the Dapper Man US. And of course our website, thedapperman.org. All right, now we're going to smoke the Hoya uh, de Nicaragua, ah, can't talk today. Hoya de Nicaragua Cinco de Queres. And we're doing this because it is the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. Yes, impressive. It is. Just the thing, everything that we had to go through uh, just to get to the moon and then to land, uh, it's just fantastic. What blows me away is the time span from uh, the Wright brothers. Mm -hmm. What was it, 1912? 1912 yeah. to landing on the moon in mm -hmm. 1969. Mm -hmm. It's almost been that same amount of time from us landing on the moon until now. Actually, I want to say that it's been more now. Yeah. I think it's like, but this year was that turning point or yeah, something. It's, yeah, it's insane that they went from mm -hmm. power human flight yeah. to landing on the moon in, in such a short yeah. period of in time. 57 years? It's, no. No, no. It's uh, 69 12. minus 12 would be 15 to 50. Yeah, 57. Yeah, okay. So we're not quite there yet. Yeah. Um, I don't do math very well. Yeah. Neither do I, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but this is the Cinco de Quedas. This is the 50th anniversary cigar from Hoya de Nicaragua. Um, they came out with two sizes. One is kind of a perfecto, uh, you know, with that little tapered torpedo on each end. And this is the Churchill is the other. Um, they do actually have other sizes coming out soon, but they just announced those at the IPCPR for 2019. So Beautiful band with the 50, mm -hmm. celebrating the 50th anniversary on there. I love the hologram on that uh, leaf yeah. in the center. Yeah, that's, that's it's just a, a very attractive mm -hmm. uh, uh, pre presentation for that cigar. Yes. Now, they, reminiscent of a, of a, you know, a high-end Cuban yeah, Cohiba type. It really is. Now, they won't actually tell you what's in here. All they will tell you is that it's Nicaragua. Nicaragua, and it's a, uh, it's a, a trade secret. Yep. Yeah. Now, let me, I have, I wrote down what they actually said on the website. It says, rise to the occasion. The most memorable celebrations always require that you rise to the occasion. The single decadence helps you do just that. I can't read the rest of my writing, but <laughs> uh, it's the most exclusive collection of tobaccos that go into the cigar. Uh, but they don't tell you what's in it or what you'll actually taste. It's intriguing that uh, a lot, a lot more of uh, the cigar blenders are doing that, having mm -hmm. private blends that they don't share. Uh, it's showing the competitive nature of, of mm -hmm. the of the market and how often uh, these guys will. Uh, I'm going to say piggyback, they would yes. probably say steal one another's uh, at least mm -hmm. some form of the blend. Of course, the, you know, the, the blend, they have to be there to pick out the, the leaves. But if, right. if you tell them, oh, it's, it's a, it's a, a Dominican yeah. binder, and it's a Nicaraguan filler, mm -hmm. and it's a Connecticut broadleaf. And, well, it's a San Andreas. Yeah, yeah you've, you've, given, you've given at least a formula. Mm -hmm. so. Exactly. So um, the band is, or sorry, the the wrapper is just beautiful. I mean, it's just a beautiful, beautiful leaf. 
good, just a good, for lack of better, mm -hmm. a good cigar smell. It's got that. Uh, it's not fruity like no, raisins. No. no, it's it's got that. Uh, it's more musky, musky tannin, like leather, leather, yeah, earth, tobacco-y smells. Yeah, a little bit of cocoa kind of buried in there, I mm. think. But I love cocoa, try, so I just imagine drop. it. I go with my uh, crown cut as usual. I'm going to use my uh, my perfect cutter from I think it's Cuban Crafters or Cuban Cutters. Uh, these Calibri Deep Bees just uh, give a great cut, mm -hmm. yeah, a magnificent cut. And then I I like to crown cut the end and mm -hmm. uh, well, per Rachel, it's now a princess cut. Is it? Oh, yes. Okay. Well, I'm not a princess, so mine's still a crown <laughs> cut. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, for me that opens up the draw quite a mm -hmm. bit, and I, I really never lose a cap that way. No, I really do like that deep V cut anyway, because it's just such a fantastic, you know, you keep the cap intact, but you still get a really good draw. Yeah. Whereas I say that, the cap comes off. Cocoa on that, for sure. Yeah. On the dry. Mm-hmm. But it's I, not a sweet cocoa. No, no. It's a, it's a. It's not like it's a semi sweet, kind of like one of the semi sweet chocolate chips. Uh, yeah, but almost like a, a, a cocoa powder, like you. Yeah, would, like you know, the actual like, baking powder. Yeah, baking yeah. powder that you wouldn't want to eat. No, but I've, it smells amazing. Have you ever done that? No, no. I, no I'm a really? smart man. <laughs> I did that once. I made a big old glass of chocolate milk with it. Mm. Started chugging it. It's like, Whoa. That's a bad day, Greg. <laughs> yes, it was. Bad day. I'm going to use my fan flame. Was I caught fan flame on mine? This is just my Jetline uh, lighter that I got from Rocky Mountain Cigar Festival last year. And this is a Churchill. They actually call it, what is it, the El General? Is what they call this thing? I always, have, have you talked much about this toasting process of toasting the foot, Greg, what, what it serves? No, I haven't. Uh, uh, you know, I, 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 you see people do it all the time. People talk about toasting the foot, but I've not seen many explanations about the purpose. I think it's so that you don't want the, t the tobacco to char. So it's kind of like building up a cake on your uh, pipe, I think. Right. At least that's my guess. That's what my, I'm going to go with. When, when I'm doing it, I look for an even uh, yes. cherry ring. And if I don't get the center hot, I'm okay. I just want, I want the, the, the outer yeah. uh, to, to get going good so that I get an even burn. Yes, you definitely want to make it as even as possible because that affects how the cigar will smoke. So, well, this is our initial light. Lots of smoke. Out of that cigar. Yes, and I just bought these earlier today. Excuse me. Bought them earlier today from uh, Luke over at Rem's place, my local tobacconist. Uh, here in Colorado, you know, Luke has these about $23 a piece. So depending on your cigar tax and how your local tobacconist will price things, 20 to 30 if he's, if he's trying to gouge you, probably more than 40 Yeah, uh, you know, with the higher taxes here, you know, this is, a pr in some states, this would be an $18 cigar. Um, yeah, where they cap the tax. Got a little bit of cocoa on that one. Let me see. I like to know what, you know, I'm actually smoking or what I'm supposed to be getting, that way I can kind of search for it. This would be a little bit different of a review for me. Uh, sweet on the on the mouth, uh, on the initial light. It does not have any sweetened in no. it, but, it, but I'm getting sweet on that. Hmm. Getting cedar or some type of wood spice. Cedar, that cool cocoa. Mm -hmm. Boy, the retro hail smoke is so cool. It is not not getting the hot. Of course, it is a yeah. That's it's a good it's, sized cigar, so you're gonna right. have a cooler smoke uh, initially anyway. But um, but a great roll. Um, mm -hmm. The draw is <clears throat> right where I like it. It's not very loose and it's no. not tight. It is it is uh, what I would call a sufficient pull on yes. a, a draw. When they're when they're so loose, I feel like mm -hmm. I'm it's... puffing the whole cigar. In one right. Puff. Right. 
So today is July 20th, uh, 2019. It is, what, about 10, 20 here in Colorado? And so that means it's time for beer. That is true. What are we actually smoking or drinking today? I forgot what actually Well, called. this is a, I'm going to try this. Uh, uh, that'd be a, Vi- a Weinenstavner. Yes. Weinenstavner. Uh, I bought this randomly out of our local uh, Fisher's Liquor Barn because it said it was from the oldest distillery in Europe. Oh, that's good. Even from the bottle, got a good head on it. Mm-hmm. I'm not surprised to see the head. Wow. That is a traditional German beer. Yeah. This is better than a lot of Oktoberfest beers. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, the Germans have not jumped on the let's make it all taste like uh, citrus hoppy yeah. pine tree. So this is a balanced that is good. beer. It's a little bit sweet. Yeah. But just a little bit. It's not over sweet. The maltiness of it is wonderful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm liking this. Thing. This is a, a 7.7% alcohol beer, too. So, so better not chug it. Um, that's a good, yeah, should have ate breakfast this morning, right? Oh, yeah. So I'm trying to remember. <coughs> if I did my math correctly, um, Apollo 11 will have landed on the moon at about 2 p.m. our time. Okay, so and just a few hours from now. Right, so about four hours from now, they will have actually landed on the moon. Then it took them an additional six hours for them to get suited up and do all their tests and everything and get permission from uh, Houston to actually do the moonwalk. You know, we take so much for granted about the knowledge that has been amassed mm-hmm. since 1968. And... Um, they they honestly had no clue if when they went to set down if the if the the lander would sink into no. the surface. Right. Uh, they they were making educated guesses, mm-hmm. but they were really guessing at the whole yeah, process. Major major assumptions. And I'm just so stunned by mm-hmm. by uh, what was achieved. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Being the nerd that I am, I brought along. I do not have an Apollo rocket because I've not committed to that. That's a yeah. Process that's a big, yeah. But this this is a, a V two. Okay. Um, this was uh, Werner von Braun, Germany. Yeah. This was what this was started off as the the missiles that Germany would drop on England mm-hmm. um, at the close of World War Two when we went in and brought out all of the uh, scientists that Operation Paperclip that uh, were were going to. Cur- you know, start off our mm-hmm. uh, rocket program, our, our program for uh, for manned flight. This is what they brought along. So yep. these were the test vehicles that came to the U.S. This is a, a, a scale model of one. This is an actual uh, uh, rocket that you, mm-hmm. you can fly. Um, uh, and uh, also uses the SC's rocket engines. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that uses an E size. If we're familiar mm-hmm. with those, it's about that big around. Um, but, the, but they started off with those right there just to kind of test out mm-hmm. everything. They use those as test platforms to prove that uh, that you could mm-hmm. actually create an aerospace program. Mm-hmm. And from that, they, they move on up mm-hmm. to the Mercury rockets. Yep. And then from the with Mercury the Atlas, uh, yeah. to the yeah, Atlas and, 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 then uh, the and then the Saturns, um, mm-hmm. which are such an amazing uh, piece of equipment. Mm-hmm. Uh, massive. So massive. If you go to Houston, uh, and go to the mission control area. They have one on the side, mm-hmm. and it is just—I mean, it's what three, four football fields. It's huge. Yeah, they've got an array at. Uh, uh, it's a wonderful display at the Smithsonian, mm-hmm. and they—it's—it's it's done mostly with mirrors, but they have a portion of uh, the the entire the entire uh, uh, nozzle display, but with the mirrors. You get the perspective of right. all all five of them. Yeah. Oh, it's huge! Yeah. It's huge, and that's at this. There's two aerospace museums mm-hmm. at the Smithsonian. This is the one that's down on the mall. Okay, uh, it's not out by Dulles. Right. So. Oh so, yes, cigars. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we're going to go ahead and continue smoking. Actually, get into the first third here past the initial light. We'll come back with the first third update and some more stories about NASA and the moon. So stay tuned. Welcome back. We are definitely into our first third here. This is a uh, Churchill, so it's what, a 7 by 50? Yes. 7 by 46, maybe? I, I think, think it's a 46. That's not a 50. No, okay. So 7 by 46, so we're definitely into our first third here. 
And uh, what are you actually tasting? I'm getting I'm getting that cocoa, definitely that cocoa. Um, we were discussing about uh, when we retro, if we if we kind of force retro, we get a lot more of that cedar. But if we if we let that retro roll and just kind of slowly come out, we get that sweet kind of cocoa. Mm -hmm. -y. And you said a little bit like uh, graham cracker, and I came back with like, the chocolate teddy graham flavor. Yeah. I don't get the gram on the retro like mm -hmm. I normally do, but once I blow out, if I if I inhale back in, mm -hmm. I'm getting kind some like of that, that, uh, that uh, uh, yeah, that good toast, mm -hmm. toasted gram. As you can see, the ash is nice and white. I think that's magnesium in the soil. Uh, rich magnesium soil causes that. Uh, the burn is pretty immaculate. I mean, just a little uneven, but you just roll that over and that'll correct itself. Yeah. And uh, we've not touched these up at all. Not at all. We've just been uh, sitting here smoking and mm -hmm. talking. Um, no mouse holes, no canoeing, no runners. It's not bananaing out uh, like um, you see in the cartoons when they stick the finger in the gun and kind of you know bananas out. I'm not doing that at all. Beautiful. I mean, there's mm -hmm. no like you said, no mouse holes. That that, that looks like a beautiful ash. Mm -hmm. No face. Get a lot of those weird faces in there. Yeah. Almost looks like the moon. Yeah, I can see that. That would be getting close enough to the camera where, where is the... See you, right? There we go. Yeah, it kind of looks like the moon. It's almost moon-like. Yep. Look at the There's the moon. <laughs> fly the rocket through. Okay, the rock of it over. The moon. It's not nerdy yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my mom used to live in Houston, and one of her nurse uh, buddies, her, uh, the nurse's husband, was a project manager at Houston. Not, but not just the project manager, he's like the director of like special projects. So he was, he got to decide what projects got funding. Now that would be so cool. Yeah. And this was years ago and they gave me a kind of a backstage pass of Mission Control. And so you know the two old Mission Control stations, right. those old rooms? Those are considered um, like national, historic. Art, yeah, national historic sites. And so they can't change them at all. And in fact, they just uh, renovated them and restored them to working order like they were back during the Apollo missions. So that's wonderful. And they weren't doing it at the time, but now you can take a tour of Mission Control. But because we had the hookup, I actually have a picture of me sitting in Mission Control oh, that's at wonderful. one of the stations. That's, yeah. I would love to do that. I've, I've not been to, to uh, uh, the, the, the Houston National mm -hmm. NASA station. I've been to the one in Cape Canaveral mm -hmm. in Florida. Um, in, you know, there's a lot of the the spent rockets and things oh, yeah. around there. Well, um, you can walk right up to, uh, what is it, Launchpad 1 for yeah. Apollo 1? It's un it's unfortunate that uh, the space program kind of fell out of favor it, and just became yeah. such a, uh, a kind commercial, of about it, yeah. commercial um, process mm -hmm. throughout our lifetimes. I remember, I remember I was, I got to watch on TV the, the very first Space Shuttle launch. Wow. It was a little bit before your time, but not yeah. too. But I remember. Mm, a little bit, yeah. Not I want to say that was around 81, 82. Yeah, Nixon canceled the Apollo stuff in favor for a low Earth orbit. And so. We had a Skylab in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, well, I remember all the Skylab hype when it was, mm -hmm. when it was uh, um, decaying in orbit mm -hmm. and it was going to fall back to Earth, and I just knew it was going to crash and land on my house. That would uh, be so fun for me. I remember when I was in Houston, my dad wanted an Apollo 11 patch. And so you go up and they have a little gift shop and it's like, okay. I'm sitting there in front of the board they have all the mission patches. And it was like Apollo 1 and, you know, they look like they're in order. But Apollo 11 does not use Roman numerals. It's the only Apollo mission that does not use Roman numerals. So I'm looking, I'm thinking Roman numerals. So I see that, you know, the 1, 2 right. as 11. Right. Or sorry, as, as, you know, instead of a 2. It, yeah. yeah. And so I'm sitting there, it's like, what? The, I cannot find it, I cannot find it. So I go over to the cashier, and he walks over, he's like, yeah, it's right there. It's like, no, that's a, you know, that's Apollo 2. I'm like, no, that was 11. Yeah. It's like, well, I feel like an idiot. Yeah, well. But everything it's else is it's understandable. Yeah. It's like Super Bowl 50. Yeah. Uh, way to be different. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they did that for the purpose of uh, commemorating the fact that they're landing on the moon. So they, they went away from the, the Roman numerals for mm -hmm. that reason. There's a really good book out called Apollo 8. It's actually, uh, I believe it's written by one of the actual astronauts. And he, I haven't read most of it. I've read the first couple of chapters. I have it at home. And it's about how originally that was not supposed to go to the moon. 
but Apollo 8 was the first time we orbited the moon. And so they, like six weeks before mission launch, which is like unheard of, they changed it up because uh, Russia had tried to, uh, was about to orbit the moon as well. So it's like, oh, we got to get there first. Well, there's something to be said about having uh, someone to compete against mm -hmm. to get something accomplished. Another mm -hmm. reason why I think that the, the space program just kind of fell out of everything. Right. It was, there was nothing, mm -hmm. nothing to achieve other than, like you said, you know, Low Earth orbit, throwing satellites up in right. space, whether they're commercial or, or government or military, whatever the, the case the case might be, um, and then you know they transition to uh, the research model of sending mm -hmm. sending things out and uh, unmanned. Uh, the, Voy the Voyager probes are two of my favorite probes uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because of Star Trek. What's your first favorite probe? Right? <laughs> <laughs> Would that be the anal probe? <laughs> Wasn't going to go there, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> you ever see that cartoon? It's the, uh, I think it's Far Side or something. It's like one in ten humans uh, doesn't mind being anally probed. <laughs> <laughs> or the movie. If you've never seen the movie Paul, definitely watch it. There's That's this, a great movie. Yeah. There's a scene where uh, it's like one of the characters is like, don't probe me. It's like, what are we going to do? What, what can we learn from an asshole? How, what are we, harvesting farts? <laughs> I feel the number is much higher than one in ten that yeah. like to be anally probed. Probably. Though. And there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> just to be clear. Just, whenever it floats your boat. Whenever it floats your boat. Yeah. I just like that Greg has several probes that he <laughs> are his favorite. But Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, uh, the Cassini space probe. Okay. Cassini, uh, because it flew through one of the ice plumes from one of the ice volcanoes on, what was it, Io or, I yeah, no, not Io, um, Europa. Yeah. Um, Voyager 1 and 2, because they are the first man-made objects to enter interstellar space. Right. And they were launched 40-something years ago, and they're still freaking working. And it's great, because we sent nudes in a mixtape. Yeah, actually, we did. <laughs> <laughs> I find that, I just find that hilarious. So um, if we ever did make contact, then they would be like, I, I think they're hitting on me. Maybe that's why they've been anal probing yeah, everybody. Exactly. They're trying to figure this process mm -hmm. out. Exactly. <laughs> the great human achievement right yeah. there. Yep. And then, of course, you have Star Trek, uh, the motion picture, which horrible special effects, but fantastic stories. One of my favorite Star Trek stories of all time. It's a story of Voyager 7, which doesn't exist, coming back to Earth. Oops. Well, that's how long an ash will last. So you have, what, a couple inches? Yeah, that's a good uh, size. Yeah. Good firm, still firm. Yeah. That's what I dropped. <laughs> Don't go there, Greg. Yeah, I wasn't going to. But uh, Voyager 7 was coming back. It had gained sentience. And it was coming back to look for its creator, look for God. And I just love that story. But, of course, I'm a huge sci-fi fan. Of huge Trek look movie. for God. That's yep. the first Star Trek movie? Yeah, well, it's looking for its creator. So. I'm going to have to go back and watch that. I don't remember that. Mm hmm Huh. Then of course, uh, my number one favorite sci-fi movie of all time is 2001: A Space Odyssey. Ooh, I like it. I can't say it's my favorite sci-fi. I guess. Yeah. But boy, if it wasn't for um, our the the American icon Tom Hanks, mm -hmm. all the things he's done yes. for his historic preservation yeah. through film. Uh, you know Apollo 13. Um, uh, of course, uh, the the work that he's done to mm -hmm. preserve history of the uh, World War II through mm -hmm. Band of Brothers, um, and then he had the HBO series about uh, the Apollo missions. Mm -hmm. and I can't remember what that one's called. What's I can't called? remember. I can't remember. Uh, I think it was just Apollo, wasn't it? Yeah, Apollo. Okay. Uh, those I love those. Apollo 13 is probably one of my favorite. Um, movies period yes uh, and I would call it a sci-fi because at the time that's really mm -hmm. what we were doing it was. and then the one uh, um, that has escaped me but it's got Sam Shepard and um, it's it's about the, the Mercury missions and the yes. Apollo missions what is that um, what is that movie it's an, it's a little bit older movie I don't know that one's a wonderful movie yeah. as well because it shows that lit, that run up mm -hmm. process to uh, how we went from this this missile mm -hmm. to a to a missile that you stuck human beings on. Right. Right. Fun fact: um, our cell phones today, our iPhones, 
have more computing power than the Apollo rockets. Most calculators have more yep, computing exactly. power than the Apollo rockets. Yep. And actually, it wasn't until, what, the mid-90s when they upgraded some of the shuttle systems. Yeah. They're I've, still running 1088 chips. Uh, the, the, shuttle, the shuttles had very, very low mm -hmm. computing power. It was almost tubes and, mm -hmm. and still at that point. Uh, almost, yeah. it's, it's insane. And again, you, when you're watching that in movies, you don't always get that. But when they're flipping switches, they, yeah. the, it's, it's just relays. They're disconnecting right. relays. Mm -hmm. It's not really computing power. No, it's not fly-by-wire. Yeah, it was, it was well, if, if we can find the right mm -hmm. order to turn on these fuses and mm -hmm. relays, things might work. Oh, yeah, and Gary Sinise is fantastic at that in Apollo 13. Mm -hmm. We're talking about we have just enough power to power this coffee pot for 12 hours. Right. And it just shows you how much power that would require. And, you know, just the state of things at the time. It's just amazing. And again, just a, a short time after they, the, they had sticks and fabric mm -hmm. um, created to, to fly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another, and if you've never been to the, the DC, you should go. Yes. At the, at the Smithsonian uh, Air and Space Museum. They've got, they've got the Wright Brothers flyer. Mm -hmm. It's been, uh, at this point in history, it's been refinished. Right. But they have a... a the, a portion of the original covering there, mm -hmm. and it is the distance from walking from that that Wright Brothers plane over to the the Saturn display. Mm -hmm. It's a very short, yeah, a very short distance, and it, and it was it's just a very short number of years. Mm -hmm. You, uh, if you look at if you look at film during that same time, right. It was silent film. Right. You've the got you, you've got you've got the the silent film that, that shows them traveling to the moon and the, right. and that sticking kind of the, the, yeah. the cheese of the mm -hmm. moon. Basically, you go from that mindset to um, to speculating and, and, and pulling off uh, not only putting human beings on the move, mm -hmm. but more importantly, bringing them back alive. Yes. It's one of my um, favorite scenes in uh, Apollo 13. We've never lost a man in space, and we're not going to start on my shift. Right. And they and pulled out all the stops to bring them back. I mean, still true to this day. Unfortunately, we have lost some, but they've they've been within that the Earth's atmosphere. Mm -hmm. They have. Um, I don't remember uh, Challenger, but I remember Columbia. I remember Challenger. So I remember when we when we had the first mm -hmm. um, first one launched. I was in the uh, I want to say maybe fifth grade. Might have been fourth. But I, I vividly remember in seventh grade when uh, when the Challenger closing happened. Yeah. I uh, I was in seventh grade. I went went down to my um, the school the school counselor's office mm -hmm. just because I was hanging out, and they were watching the, the launch. Mm -hmm. So I think it was during a uh, a planning period for me, um, mm -hmm. and so I was watching the launch, and then the explosion happened, and mm -hmm. then the, basically the whole school it didn't shut down, but they yeah. started bringing in TVs for to mm -hmm. the rooms and. You know that was a big deal because uh, right. Kristen McAuliffe, being a school teacher, she was the first. Uh, yeah. She was the first civilian to go into space, mm -hmm. and it was it was for that reason they were really hyping, hyping it up, it up yeah. in schools as they should have, as they still should have mm -hmm. be doing to today. Yeah. Um, and then as close as I've come to seeing a, an an actual uh, launch, I was I was in Orlando one time. Oh, nice. When one it wasn't the last shuttle mission, but one of the last okay. shuttle missions. Um, and you could see the you could see the the plume, the, the plume arc nice. from Orlando. So, nice. my uh, former uh, coworker of mine, he's a navy, he's a retired Navy commander. He uh, retired just before they were going to give him his own aircraft carrier. Uh, he worked for my IT consulting company, and then he retired after like twenty five years of that. He lives in Jacksonville, Florida, and all the. Um, was it SpaceX, uh, uh, Elon Musk? All those launches are in Cape Canaveral. He can see them from not, not like close, but he can see them from his balcony in his condo on the beach. That's impressive. And uh, he has a very nice camera setup, so he can actually take pictures of the launches. The space, the SpaceX, and the uh, booster rockets, and mm -hmm. how they they come, they fly back and land vertically. Mm -hmm doesn't look real. It doesn't, no. I've watched it several times, and it looks like a special effect. It does. It doesn't make sense how that works. And I'll see if I can find it, but uh, there's a video of there's a, something called binaural surround sound. It's like ultimate surround sound, and you want to listen to this with like your best headphones. And it takes a, a special camera, special microphones, 
but they were there on one of the launches, and they actually got the video, or take the video, from the top of the building where they used to assemble the Saturn rockets. And when those booster rockets land, you can actually hear, I think, a seven or eight distinct uh, sonic booms. Because each one of the fins, you know, has a sonic boom when it comes down. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Just the advances that we've made, and look mm. what we've done with it. We have cool phones. Yes. And cars that beep at you when you yes. get too close to another car. <laughs> put, it, put it to good use. Yes. Part of me does want, when I die, eventually, uh, part of me wants to be launched into space in my old Jack convertible, kind of like uh, the Elon Musk uh, Oh, yeah, we did accomplish man. that, too. Yeah. He sent a car into space. Yeah. You know, I, I want a bumper sticker on the back, you know, space ball style. I break for no one. <laughs> that way in the future, some space race will be like, what the heck is this dude? <laughs> what? Was that, that car is just sent on a particular trajectory? It's just mm-hmm. out there going towards yeah, it's, somewhere? Yeah, it's orbiting between Earth and Mars, and it will be for like the next 10,000 years. Really? Yeah. Wow. You wow. can actually track it. You can actually, there's websites where you can track exactly where it is and how far it's gone. I wonder when it's coming in a close Earth, Earth orbit if you can see it with a telescope. Probably. Well, I know you can. You can probably see it now if you know where to look, because I have a telescope that I can see the moons of Jupiter. That would be, wouldn't that be hilarious sometime in the future? Maybe maybe the history of that gets lost mm-hmm. because it is somewhat trivial. Yeah. And someone's out there looking through a telescope and they're like, Yeah. I just saw, Did what? What? I think I saw a dude in a car. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like Futurama, you know? <laughs> it's like, what? So we're actually going to continue into our second third here, and we'll come back with another uh, update on the flavors and the construction and everything. But so far this is a very good stick, and I would highly recommend it, but stay tuned for the second third. Welcome back. We are definitely into our second third here. He's already taken the band off. I've left mine on just to kind of show you where we are. Uh, Start with the construction. Immaculate burn still, um, no issues whatsoever. Um, Cap is intact. Greg's uh, ash only looks that way because he's been rolling his, I yeah. think, on the side. But you know, the the burn has stayed consistent mm-hmm. throughout. Um, we're taking our time smoking it, really, mm-hmm. just chatting up in between uh, uh, filming se- sessions here. Um, it's smoked wonderful. Mm-hmm. I, I've had a few of these at this point, probably half a dozen. Mm-hmm. Um, They've all smoked great. I've had both Vitolas. Um, the the Figuardo is, mm-hmm. is my preferred. Oh, okay. Um, um, just because I, I like a Figuardo. Mm-hmm. Um, this has been a very consistent, got a little peppery for me here in the second, third. Not overwhelming by any means, but there's just some pepper there. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's kind of been the prevailing flavor here mm-hmm. in the second, third still have that same toastiness that I don't really get as much as the cocoa right now. I'm, no. I'm suspecting as we get into that back third, it'll mm-hmm. come back around. Um, so this is one of those, you know, good cigars that's going to build a little bit, but yeah. slowly um, it's going it's to be something I would recommend to someone who's into a good medium yeah. bodied cigar, but who wants to get into that more mm-hmm. full bodied because medium to full. this starts off medium enough that it's not overwhelming. Right. A lot of times if you jump in those full bodies, when you first start smoking, they they just yeah. knock you on your socks. Yeah. Some pepper is over, overpowering your mouth. This one doesn't do that, but you do, I'm getting a lot of that pepper right now. Getting a lot of cedar, um, not a lot of the pepper, but a lot of that cedar spice. For me, the pepper's on the just on the mouth um, it's not on the lips it's just as I sit here and I talk mm-hmm. my tongue's got that pepperiness to it getting the leather of the earth I'm also smoking a little bit faster to try to catch up it's also why my uh, ash is coning a little bit but uh, ooh, on that you know just inhaling that your uh, smoke there on that room note got some cocoa and I'm getting cocoa on that long finish yeah so, For me, it's still that same toasty cocoa-y. Okay. Okay. This beer's been a, a great pairing. Yes, it has. Uh, the Weinenstoffner. Mm-hmm. I'm sure someone can correct that. Yes. But Weinenstoffner. Yes. Um, our Werner Von Braun uh, tribute <laughs> beer. Yep. We were just talking about movies and other things, and one of my other favorite sci-fi movies is Contact. Oh, that's a really good mm-hmm. movie. Uh, I enjoyed Contact a lot. And then the one recently with Amy Adams. Um, 
Is that a rival? Is that what it's called? Where the, she's the linguist? Yes. Oh, that one. That is great. one of my top ten favorite sci-fi movies of all time. I, if you have not seen that, you should watch that movie. Yes. That'll, that'll challenge your mind it to does. think about things in ways that were, were were great. And I don't remember seeing previews for it. I remember I was on Facebook, and the it wasn't a preview, but it was a little video like challenging. How do two people communicate if they don't speak the same language? And so they had like a Japanese guy and uh, a Hispanic man trying to talk to each other. And they had, you know, several different versions of that. It was just amazing. And that's what caught my interest in the movie. How would we actually talk to aliens if they did ever land, if we did ever make contact? And in other movies, they talk about, you know, prime numbers and contact with those prime numbers mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Well, and you go with E.T. and and Independence Day, it's, it's lights, mm -hmm. it's flashes, it's, it's sounds. Mm -hmm. It's intriguing. I don't. How would you communicate with an unknown mm -hmm. entity right. subject? Right. Uh, there's no. There's no comparison. Well, that's not true. I suppose uh, uh, human to mammalian. Right. And you know maybe dolphins. Right. But the challenge is we don't really communicate. Right. Because it's not two way. Exactly. Um, I don't know that we've achieved two-way communication with with that with other than a humanoid interaction. Right. Yeah, I agree. I think I read something that dogs can understand with two hundred words. Cats can understand us all, but choose not to. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> I always like the far side that shows. You know, it's the guy talking to the dog, and the dog's name's like, uh, uh, you know, uh, Rover, and the oh. dog, the guy's like, Rover, you're such a good boy. I really love you, and and, and it shows Rover here. Rover, blah, 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 blah. Rover, yeah. blah, 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 blah. So. Yeah. So it's interesting. Um, it also challenges, for me, it challenged me to think how I communicate with other people. Uh, I'm also reading a book called The Philosopher's Toolkit, and they talk about the ideas behind words. And somehow it's easy to understand, but sometimes it's not. Right. And that's uh, where a lot of the difficulties with communication come in. That's the biggest failure in humanity is communication. Everything yeah. boils down to communication. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a, a, a relationship mm -hmm. between two individuals, a family, or yeah. countries. It's yep. communication. Mm -hmm. And uh, trying to find that common, uh, common thing that you can build off of for communication. And semantics, mm -hmm. the, the, the understanding of a right. word is so challenging. Oh, we've um, talked about that here in the lounge several times. Oh yeah, I'm jokingly about many things. And, yeah. uh, but but the reality is that's that's difficult when I speak a word mm -hmm. with no malice at all. Right. And someone in their entire life has always interpreted that word mm -hmm. with malice. You can't you can't get past that. Right. Well, you can kind of see that with uh, symbols. Um, most recently with the Nike and the uh, 13 Colony swag yeah. and Colin Kaepernick and how, yes, for most of us that is a symbol of our heritage and founding of our nation, but I did some research and several very, very, very right-wing extremist groups have adopted that flag as their symbol, as well as like the Confederate battle flag saying we need to go back to the time when we had slaves and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, see that's, again, it's a semantical argument right. uh, because, you know, being a kid of the 80s, mm -hmm. when I see the Confederate flag, I just think of the, the, right, Dukes, Lee, yeah. the Duke boys. And, yeah. uh, and uh, I've got a lot of friends from the South, and they, mm -hmm. it's, it, it has zero to do with right. uh, slave ownership. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's part of their heritage, heritage and yeah. pride. Yeah. Um, I did see a great post that uh, right where right the Kaepernick stuff was happening, and it was uh, Captain America. Mm -hmm. And it said, uh, when you realize that you only have one star, and so you're, you're really Captain Puerto, Puerto Rico. Rico. <laughs> yeah. I like that That was lot. hilarious. You must be Captain Texas, don't they only have one flag? They, they have one star, and there's, <coughs> there's a red and white, so it could be Captain Texas. I'm Texas sure, would yeah. probably love that. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, getting back to the cigar, though, construction is still fantastic. No issues whatsoever. Burns immaculate. Um, we're probably about an hour and a half into this. Uh, hour right. at least. We're we're yeah, hour twenty minutes. Okay, I would say. And well, that's actually pretty quick for a cigar this size. Um, uh, great taste. Um, 
Yeah, it's a really, really good stick. I, I'm not much at letting my cigar rest. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I don't sit mine down very often. I'm a puffer. Um, so I have to, especially when I'm getting to this portion of cigar, I really have to consciously think to not over-smoke <coughs> it to get it too hot. Yeah. Right now I can tell the smoke's getting warmer as it's coming in, so I, I really need to just rest it a little And it gets a little, a little metallic bit. taste when you do that. Yeah, a little metallic taste. You, you, uh, if you're a pipe smoker, you know, you get tongue bite when you smoke mm -hmm. a pipe. Um, you really don't get that with a cigar, though. You don't, but I've, I've, a couple of times I've, I've puffed one so quick that mm -hmm. I thought, oh, I'm getting a little... Not as much as focused tongue bite. Right. But my, I'm like my tongue is feeling uh, is feeling burnt out. And you definitely do that on uh, the retrohale. If you're smoking too fast, then you retrohale. Oh yeah. It'll burn oh. your sinuses. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. When people always ask, well, does it hurt when you do that? I'm like, no, not if you do it right. Because right. if you do it right with cool smoke, you don't feel it. Mm -hmm. But you do it with hot smoke and woo wee. Okay. So we're going to uh, sit here and continue smoking our cigars. I'm trying to think if there's anything else about the moon I wanted to. I think first orbit of the moon was 1959 by a Russian unmanned object. Okay. Um, twelve people have actually walked on the moon. Only twelve. All Americans. All uh, men. Um, it's really fascinating. Uh, um, and and only a few are still alive. Yes. I think. Are there eight still alive? I think so. I think twelve so. human beings. Have, have set foot outside of our planet, mm -hmm. and that is it. Now, there's been numerous who have been in space, right. hundreds. Oh, yeah. Probably thousands at yes. this point. But to set foot on an alien, an, an alien mm -hmm. uh, surface, right. only 12. 12. And I was researching the formation of the moon, because there are a lot of different theories out there. Right now, scientists, the main theory is that there was another planetoid uh, about four and a half billion years ago, about the size of Mars, and that actually hit Earth. There was actually a cosmic impact. And they think it was uh, on our same orbital plane, but the gravity between um, Venus and Jupiter kind of had it spinning, kind of like going through space like this. And it hit the Earth at a 45 degree angle at about four kilometers an hour. And that's what caused the mantle of the two planets to inject a you know a nice chunk of mass into space that eventually formed into the moon and those two planets eventually formed into earth uh, the other planet was named Thea and we're of course with Gia or Gaia and so the the evidence between that is before that is because our crust our mantle is a lot thicker than it should be and our core is a lot bigger than it should be for a planet of our size you nerds <laughs> It's another lounge member contributing. Yeah. I was going to actually say the same thing, but he's definitely whipped out into far geek feel on that one. <laughs> I'm a nerd. I can't help it. <laughs> I'm a nerd too, but there are varying degrees of nerds. <laughs> yes. Yes. But I love it. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. Yeah. Um, much like a cigar is made from multiple components. Exactly. Um, I'm trying to think. They said it was about the size of Mars. The moon is also the, our only natural uh, satellite. It is the sixth largest natural satellite in our uh, solar system. Really? Yep. Huh. Uh, it's also one sixth the gravity, or one sixth the size of Earth, and so it has one sixth the gravity, about sixteen point eight percent, if I remember correctly. If we were smoking these on the moon, we couldn't. That's true. <laughs> well, we could in our spacesuits, but I'm sure that wouldn't be healthy for well, us. Well, in a pure oxygen environment, it would probably turn out badly. Yes. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to continue into the final third here. Uh, we'll pull some more moon stuff out of our butt, and uh, we'll finish up the uh, the review. So stay tuned for that. More probes to come. <laughs> Welcome back. We are definitely into our final third here. Uh, can, I, I actually set my cigar down to cool a little bit uh, at the end of the second third. There, I was puffing a little fast on it. Uh, definitely wanted to enjoy the cigar. Mainly because we're having a great conversation and because it's just a really good cigar. I let mine rest a little bit too, but I was slowly sipping at it throughout that time. So my my uh, burn and ash have had been 100% consistent in, through the entire process. Like Greg said, you know, yeah. there's there's little blips, but mm -hmm. that I mean you'd expect that with a with a leaf an natural right. product, and it just it has self corrected. I've not touched this nope. with a lighter. I've not relit yet. Nope. nope. Um, and Greg and I have been sitting here uh, t 
talking this entire time. Mm -hmm. We're going on two hours at this point. Yep. And our second. Uh, yes. Our second Vine and Stoffner. We're almost. It's almost noon here in Colorado, and we're on our second beer. So yes. It's, you know, it's a typical Colorado day. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, ash, a little, little grayer now, not as white. Um, that kidney set construction has been absolutely fantastic. No issues with the cap, no tunneling, no runners, no canoeing, no mouse holes. Um, it hasn't tarred up at all. No. That's, you know, really, tarring has a lot to do with uh, how fast you're smoking mm -hmm. a cigar. It, it, it has to do with the cigar as well, but how fast you're smoking, and for me, how wet you're smoking. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if if you're a if you are a, a wet smoker, if you've got that you know real right. soggy end, that that tends to yeah. do that. Or if you're one of those interesting people who like to dip your cigar in something, which I am not a fan of because you're ruining both. Uh, yeah, that that'll that'll collect that tar there. But there are definitely some cigars mm -hmm. that'll that'll do that on their own. But uh, but uh, the times that I feel like that I've had issues. Um, it's probably more with my smoking technique mm -hmm. than anything else. Yeah. Flavor. I'm getting that cocoa, almost a coffee on a long finish. Uh, not as much cedar, real creamy at this point. And my prediction that that pepperiness would, would pass definitely happened. It's it's mellowed out here at the end, back to similar to mm -hmm. the beginning, but uh, but even I would agree, even probably a little bit more mellow at the, mm -hmm. at the um, this last third. Absolutely. An outstanding cigar. I would. Yes. I would recommend this at uh, even at the price point that it yeah. is. It might not be an everyday smoke. <clears throat> no, definitely not. Or maybe at least for, not you, for me, a yeah. uh, twenty dollars smoke is an everyday <clears throat> smoke. Right. And if it is, add this to your lineup. Yes. It's really good cigar. Another Drew Estate mm -hmm. win. I would say. Does Hoya, Drew uh, do Hoya? Hoya de, Hoya de Nicaragua is a Drew Estate okay. brand. Um, it's been around longer than Drew, but it's mm -hmm. it was kind of folded in. Okay. I believe that's the the. Um, uh, plantations and things that, that Drew Estate went into, um, but uh, a great cigar. Definitely, uh, it has to be Longfill. I would I would assume nothing lasts than Longfill. Oh, I know. There's, you know, there's no way it's a short fill. No, a premium cigar these days is all Longfill. Mm -hmm. um, even even a lot of your uh, your inexpensive cigars are Longfill anymore. And with the way that the regulations are trying mm -hmm. to go. Um, if it's going to be called a cigar in the future, I really think it's going to have to be long fill, even yeah. your smaller cigars. And and Drew does Drew does have a couple short yeah. fill cigars. Like but the factory seconds or factory well, smokes. The factory smokes, I think, are actually a long I, fill. Okay. Uh, but like their, um, I think the Isla del Sol okay. and the La Vieja are okay. short I fill cigars. Vieja, so yeah. um, you know, inexpensive uh, $5, $6 mm. cigars. But the factory smokes, I'm going to have to check. But I think those are a long fill. Okay. I think those are kind of like a second. Okay. Or a training cigar for most. And you hear second and you think that there's something less about the cigar. And most companies, that's not the case. No, it's just a blemish on the, oops, this ash. It's a blemish on the uh, wrapper. It usually was making a second. And uh, a blemish on the wrapper or it's uh, it's the cigars that they that are uh, the they use when they're training their mm -hmm. rollers. Yeah. So the, the rollers aren't as consistent. Mm -hmm. and what the factory smoke the story behind those are and that's a here that's a two dollar and 75 cent cigar right. so in some of your shops that might be under two bucks um that what was happening was as they roll they get to smoke and uh what they were seeing was that their rollers were smoking a lot of their higher end ligas and things like that so they said look we're going to create a blend mm -hmm. that you guys can smoke here as your roll and so that's where that, that cigar okay. came from. They That's the cigar that as all of their rollers are rolling, mm -hmm. these are cigar people, they can smoke all those all day long, all they want. And so then they just started to produce them. So that's that's the story behind the factory smokes. And so I would I would recommend you try mm -hmm. those. And maybe we ought to do a review yeah. on some. There's They're really good. Um, for a switch for that price point, definitely a great golf cigar. And mm. they even have a couple that have a sweet tip. I'm not a big fan of the sweet tip cigars. I'm not a fan of acids because of that sweet tip, uh, that casing. But they have a couple that aren't and that are right. really good. I don't mind a, the, the, the sweetener on the tip. I don't, I don't care for an infused cigar okay. at all. So so we ought to, we could probably maybe do a review where we review several in, mm -hmm. this, in the same review. Yeah. 
um, because because of the price point, you don't have to smoke the whole freaking cigar. Right. You know, you're like, I'd really like a smoke, but I only have 15 minutes, and you mm. don't want to smoke a little cigarette. Right. Pick up a two dollar and fifty cent cigar yeah. and you smoke a quarter of it and you mm. chuck it. Yep. Who cares? I guess those are really great for uh, golf courses. Because I know when I golf, I sit down my cigar and then I walk off and forget it. Yeah. So you don't. I would not take this. Or cigar it gets wet. And you can't yeah. smoke it anymore. Yeah. This cigar is definitely for me a special occasion cigar. Just because of the price point, it's a really, really good stick. I love the flavor, but because of that price point, it's a celebratory cigar. And with, again, not uncommon when you get down to this size. Mine just went out. I'm not going to attribute that to the cigar as much as my smoking um, and uh, moisture buildup. Yeah. So they get a little harder to burn. Yeah. So I'm going to have to do my first relight. So we'll see what it what it does on a relight. Yeah. Um, I don't know about you guys out there, but when I relight, I, I do it like a I go ahead and get the outside burning first, yeah. um, so I don't get it some kind of crazy burn off mm -hmm. of my uh, my relight. Here's what I do as well. I'm very careful. I've caught my face on not on fire, but I burned my my beard before uh, on a relight. One yes. Too short. <laughs> yeah, definitely I've burned my mustache before. I don't get that bitterness on the relight that you get sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, when I relight, I'll blow, I'll puff out yeah. on my cigar. And but I do that throughout the smoke as well. I haven't done it on this one uh, as much, but uh, definitely I'll blow through the cigar. Really on the relight, no bitterness, no none of that, uh, none of that tarry <coughs> harshness. Okay. That cough was from me inhaling Greg's smoke, not from my cigar. If I had to choose an everyday version of the cigar, it'd probably be the CAO Flathead. Um, nothing against this cigar. Uh, this is a really, really good cigar. But if I wanted something very similar in uh, flavor profile and in uh, strength, I'd probably want that Flathead. If you're new, to, if you're new to cigars, I would, uh, I would say this is one that I would work up towards. Absolutely. But I would put this on my list of cigars mm -hmm. to work up towards. Right. Um, par partially because of the price point, and but more importantly, you want to develop a little bit of a palate, mm -hmm. so you can appreciate something like this that you yeah. invest in. Uh, but uh, the Cinco de Cadiz, mm -hmm. um, really, really good cigar. I would definitely recommend that you uh, pick one up and mm -hmm. smoke Absolutely. one. Um, I can only imagine this after like a long day out working in the yard after like a oh, decent yeah. meal. This would be fantastic. We've been smoking it with a with a pretty um, a pretty a good stout beer, mm -hmm. but a, but a very uh, flavorful beer. I'm curious. Greg mentioned that he almost got a uh, a blue moon to go with this. Uh, this had a, a hint initially, a very small hint of some fruitiness. Mm -hmm. And I wonder with a beer like a Blue Moon that has more of that citrus, right. if that wouldn't bring it out a little bit? Probably. Or something so, a little fruity, like a nice whiskey with some fruit, like something finished in a sherry cask. Oh, yeah. So I think the next time I smoke one, I might try that and see what that does with this cigar. Mm -hmm. um, again, one of the great things about cigars is the complexity of them and how you can uh, manipulate mm -hmm. some of the flavors in them. Absolutely. And there's nothing wrong at all with, you know, reading those complex uh, reviews mm. that have, you know, that list off 10 different flavors, which is outside of my ability yeah. to, to comprehend because my palate is just not there yet, even after 20 mm. years, but I'm really working to train my palate now. But but try cigars with different pairings. Absolutely. And see how it affects them. Yes. Um, and I'm not good on taking notes, um, and, I, and I should yeah. be. Yeah, uh, because I'll smoke a cigar and know that I enjoyed that mm. cigar, and someone will say, well, "What was it that you liked about it?" And I'll think, "I don't I have remember." No idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know if it's good, I remember it. You know, I remember the cigar. I know if it's bad, I definitely remember it. And yeah, why. yeah. I can look at a band of a cigar and go, "Nope, I'm not buying that," because yeah. I smoked it once and I know I didn't like it. Mm. And occasionally I'll go back. For me, there's there's one particular brand that I'm not even going to mention it because it's not fair to them. A very 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 popular cigar that's mm. been around forever. And I have tried them multiple times, and I don't like them at all. Okay. It's n and it's it's just my palate. Yeah. It's nothing to do with the cigar. Mm -hmm. There are big sellers in every store that they're out there. They're probably in every store that's out there. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a legacy brand that's been around for a bajillion years. It's not my thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I would. Uh, I'm not I'm not a 
I'm not a Drew disciple. Right. Um, I don't say that everything Drew makes is great, uh, but that's because I'm not I'm not an infused person, and so many of their cigars are in that acid line. I just don't. It, I just can't. I can't manage them right. at all. Uh, but outside of their infused cigar line, um, I've smoked. At this point, I honestly can say. I believe because I, I was lucky enough to smoke a Liga 10 mm -hmm. not not too long ago. I've smoked every cigar outside nice. of their acid line, and I've not had a cigar that I wouldn't purchase again. Oh, nice! So that that says a lot. Not that I'm mm -hmm. anyone in particular, but I am someone who who pays for every single cigar that yeah. I smoke, and I've not felt like I um, wasted any money on a on one of the Drew Estate cigars, mm -hmm. other than their. Uh, infused, infused. Um, but that, but that's just me. Mm -hmm. So, so if you've never smoked one of these and you're looking for something uh, kind of special to try, definitely give it a shot. Um, construction uh, getting a, again is fantastic. Flavor is fantastic. Price point is a little high, so again that's why it's just not an everyday stick for me. But very very good cigar. I think we're going to wrap it up. Anything else you want to say? No, no, okay. I would agree, Greg. This is a good cigar. Highly recommended. Mm -hmm. If I were. Uh, had the means, I would smoke one of these. Uh, oh, if I had the means, regularly. yeah, absolutely. Regularly, I'd put this in a rotation. Mm -hmm. um, at this price point, when you're looking at wherever you're at, mm -hmm. the, at this price point cigar, for you, you're just going to have to compare it to the other cigars yeah. in that price point. I would say at this price point, I would pick this cigar up um, along with the other cigars in that mm -hmm. price point. When, yeah. when I'm buying that, like you said here, $23, $23 mm -hmm. cigar here, this is one that I would walk by and go, yeah, I'm going to take one of those. And yep. there's, there's a number of others that I mm -hmm. like too, but uh, this is a really good cigar. I generally have um, one or two of these in my in my locker at any given time. I may have to start doing that. Well, I think that's going to be it for uh, this uh, cigar review. Go ahead and uh, if you like this video, give us a thumbs up. Go ahead and subscribe to The Dapper Man. You can, again, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, all at the Dapper Man US. And I'm going to give myself a plug here. I'm on uh, Instagram at cigar underscore Santa. Yep. Um, like me if you if you care to see. Uh, I don't really do many reviews, but no. I smoke a lot of cigars. Put a, mm -hmm. put a couple of notes on there. Yep. And you can also find Dapper Man at thedapperman.org. So uh, I hope you have a fantastic day wherever you are, and we'll talk to you all soon. Bye. Bye.